Young Turks, everybody. Ben Mankiewicz here for Jenk. Good Friday to you. It's not actually Good Friday, but still hope you have an actual Good Friday. J.R. Jackson, Jesus out there, and it'll be long in an hour with a great story from New Orleans about how it's okay to have vaginal intercourse if you're a hooker, but not oral sex or anal sex. Then you've committed a crime against nature. Maybe the dumbest story I've read in some time. Dumbest law, greatest story. A lot to get to today. We're going to start with the uh, Republican presidential debate last night on Fox. Could not possibly have gone easier on these guys. Brett Baer, who was moderating the debate for Fox. There were also some other people from Fox. Chris Wallace was one of the uh, questioners there, and uh, some woman who was very attractive. I don't know her name. Uh, and some other dude. Juan Williams, that was the other guy there. Okay, so uh, hard to believe some of these guys were Republicans. The five guys there were uh, Ron Paul and Gary Johnson. Ron Paul, obviously congressman from Texas, libertarian. Gary Johnson, former governor of New Mexico, also a libertarian. Then Tim Pawlenty, the only theoretical top-tier candidate, although I, I don't know why he's a top-tier candidate. He's a top-tier candidate because we're calling him a top-tier candidate because he looks like a top-tier candidate, but he's a two-term governor of Minnesota, former governor of Minnesota. Gary Johnson, former governor of New Mexico, uh, just because the media calls Tim Pawlenty a top-tier candidate. Uh, also uh, there, uh, Rick Santorum and Herman Cain from Godfather Pizza, Godfather's Pizza. Is it Godfather or Godfather's? I think it's, God, God, it's gotta be Godfather's, right? I guess, yeah. Anyway, I've never, I've never had it, but he apparently uh, built it up and did very well. Uh, and uh, he apparently won the debate, so we'll be uh, showing you some evidence that he uh, kicked ass in the debate, although, man, those answers look rehearsed. So, uh, but what was weird is that so many of these guys, because of these libertarians, man, they don't sound like Republicans. Ron Paul, uh, the Defense of Marriage Act, he's like, yeah, government's got no business in it. Gay people want to get married? Nah, I don't care. Whatever. Uh, Gary Johnson was like, yeah, uh, woman's right to choose? Nah, whatever. The government's got no business being involved. Yeah, these guys will get the nomination. Uh, but the best part was, uh, was Ron Paul saying that uh, the government should legalize heroin. <laughs> and he's like, and then his quote about it was, hey, uh, it's not like if uh, everybody, uh, is heroin's legalized, it's not like everybody's going to do heroin. <laughs> So basically, legalize heroin, gay people can get married, and women can have abortions. I don't know. In some ways, these guys did not sound like Republicans. Also, there was a black guy there. So anyway, it was a fun debate, certainly. Uh, you did not see the former president there. I can tell you that. And if Tim Pawlenty is a top-tier candidate, uh, he ran the risk of getting sort of dragged down into the second tier. But those libertarians, man... I, you know, libertarians got no business in the White House, you know, because they don't want the roads paved. Um, but I got to tell you, they're interesting, and they think we should leave Afghanistan, um, which you got to think is awesome. Uh, and they say really interesting things, like the government shouldn't be involved in these social issues. Okay, so uh, anyway, let's uh, go to some of the debate. This is one thing that happened early in the debate that I was a big fan of. So here is uh, Rick Santorum, uh, former uh, Pennsylvania senator. Uh, Rick Santorum is a um, bigot. That's the word I'm looking for. Uh, Rick Santorum couldn't hate gay people more. Uh, he has also uh, essentially said that uh, earlier that he said women who work outside the house uh, do so because of radical feminism. So if you're a woman and you have a job, it's because of radical feminism, not because, you know, you want to earn a living, support your family, or you just want to work. No, radical feminism if you work outside the house. He, he's backtracked on that. Yeah, what a shock. Um, so Rick Santorum uh, started uh, laying into Obama's foreign policy. And Santorum uh, said that everything good that Obama has done has been just a continuation of George Bush's foreign policy. Rick Santorum has decided that the way to win the presidency is to praise George Bush, whose name in 2008 essentially did not come up in the campaign. John McCain ran from him. I mean, Barack Obama brought him up because it was fun. But Republicans had no interest in bringing up George Bush. Rick Santorum, astute political mind that he is, running toward George Bush. So Rick Santorum, bigot and dumb. And here's his little take also on what Barack Obama has he's done well is, is continuing George Bush policies. What he's done poorly is anything new. And here's his nonsensical answer. What President Obama has done on his watch 
the issues that have come up while he's been president, he's gotten it wrong strategically every single time. Whether it's in Central America, Colombia and Honduras, whether it's in the Middle East, with Egypt, with Syria, and most importantly, with Iran. We had an opportunity 18 months ago to topple a regime that is a sworn enemy, is at war with this country, is funding uh, terrorist attacks against our troops and in the Middle East, and the President of the United States sided with, sided with the mullahs. Holy crap! The President sided with the mullahs. I mean, the country, and they're, they're attacking our troops, funding an attack on our troops, the Iranians, and the President sided with the mullahs in addition to apparently screwing things up in Colombia and Honduras and Egypt, which I thought went fairly well and Libya, and uh, uh, Syria, and every other place, but he sided with the mullahs. That's incredible. What an amazing story. Obviously, in that case, so I, I will give Fox credit for this. Uh, Brett Baer, who was moderating the debate, did ask Rick Santorum a very, very tough uh, follow-up question. And the President of the United States sided with, sided with the mullahs instead of the demonstrators. Congressman Paul, you have wanted to pull U.S. troops out of Afghanistan for years. Uh, in fact, you said on the House floor about the U.S. military's efforts in Afghanistan, quote, whose interests do we serve by continuing this exercise in futility? Well, I'm sure he meant to ask a tough follow-up question, but, you know, there's not a lot of time. <laughs> Come on, man. The president sides. Look, even if you want to support these guys, just in the interest of good TV, wouldn't you just say, supported the mullahs? What do you mean? Also, don't you want to see Rick Santorum squirm a little bit? I'd be like, Hondur how do you screw up Honduras? Because you know Rick Santorum doesn't have an answer for that. He screwed up Honduras because he let Honduran men have sex with dogs. It's outrageous! Total clown. So uh, anyway, you saw that question being asked to Ron Paul then by Brett Baer with that tough follow-up to Rick Santorum. Ron Paul got a lot of applause because Ron Paul makes a great point. He's like, hey, man, we got uh, Osama bin Laden. Obviously, if we got Osama bin Laden, you know what's coming next. But we went to Afghanistan to get him, and he hasn't been there. Now that he's killed, boy, it is a wonderful time for this country now to reassess it and get the troops out of Afghanistan and end that war that hasn't helped us and hasn't helped anybody in the Middle East. So, you know, those libertarians, man, there's a lot of crossover there with the libertarians and a lot of progressives who want to see, uh, like, what are we doing there? Man? What's the game plan? What's the goal? Um, so, uh, I, Ron Paul's supporters there, but I think uh, a lot of people support the idea of getting out of Afghanistan. I don't think that applause is just from Ron Paul's supporters who always turn out uh, in droves uh, for that debate. So, th that was certainly uh, interesting. And again, a tough, very tough follow-up question there to Rick Santorum. That was the follow-up question to Rick Santorum. So, uh, and then Ron Paul followed that up with, so what are we doing there? It hasn't helped anybody. Uh, it hasn't helped us. It hasn't helped anybody in the Middle East. And we should legalize heroin. And gay people should get married. Republicans, woo, vote for me. <laughs> um, now, the winner of the debate, apparently, by all accounts, in stunning fashion, according to pollster Frank Luntz, and we'll bring you that momentarily, the overwhelming winner of this debate was uh, from Godfather's Pizza. Herman Cain, who apparently seemed very frank and very honest in a degree to which the other candidates, especially like Tim Pawlenty and, you know, Ron Paul and Gary Johnson uh, at least seem incredibly candid. They do not seem polished. They seem uh, very honest. Uh, Tim Pawlenty uh, and uh, Rick Santorum, they're like clown politicians. They just seem so cookie cutter, these guys. And if I remembered the fifth guy in the debate right now, I would probably include him uh, in that group. Who's the fifth dude in the debate? Gary Johnson? No, Gary He's Johnson. Gary Johnson seemed totally honest. Uh, and then Ron Paul. And Oh, yeah, Herman Cain, the guy I'm talking about, the black guy. Everybody forgets the black guy. Okay, so the other four white dudes. So Ron Paul and Gary Johnson, see, they don't seem like cookie-cutter politicians. Tim Pawlenty and Rick Santorum do. Uh, but Herman Cain seemed particularly genuine and particularly honest, and it definitely resonated uh, with people watching the debate, although uh, 
the way these people answered the question was a little creepy. Before we give you that, before we give you Frank Luntz polling the audience, let's get a little of Herman Cain. Uh, so these are, uh, let's do, uh, let's do Stu Cain's closing remarks. Is that better, JR? Yeah, let's do Cain's uh, uh, closing remarks instead of gas prices. Although I may come back to gas prices because we got some interesting stuff on gas prices and oil drilling, which is a shocking development. They have nothing to do with each other. Um, so anyway, here's uh, uh, Herman Cain's uh, closing remarks, uh, part of what everybody loved who was watching the debate, the Republicans loved, um, about what Herman Cain said. Fellow patriots in this exceptional nation, the United States of America, we need real economic growth, a real energy independence plan, real national security clarity, and we're only going to get it with real leadership, not more positionship. God bless you, and yes, God is blessing America. I think what America really needs, Herman Cain followed that up, we don't have the whole clip, is what America really needs uh, is more uh, Italian sausage, uh, which I couldn't agree with more. Um, so Herman Cain from Godfather Pizza, I don't know if he's still there, I keep saying Godfather, I'm sure it's Godfathers. Um, so he, he, apparently, well that wasn't particularly arousing, uh, and I'm not sure that positionship is a word that you want to be throwing around a lot. I don't doubt it. Let's hear a little of clip four about gas prices to give you an idea of maybe how he resonated with the crowd, but I'll probably cut this off at, at some point. So here's Herman Cain uh, last night in Greenville, South Carolina on gas prices. Cain, the national average price for a gallon of gasoline is now close to $4, and it's approaching $5 in some states. So Mr. Cain, what will President Cain do to alleviate skyrocketing gas prices. Contrary to what President Obama said when he stated that wasn't anything that he could do in the short term, that simply is not true. The one thing that the president can do is to establish a real energy independence plan. We have all of the resources we need right here in this country to establish energy independence if we had the leadership. Now, the, the, the things, the dynamics that impact the price of oil and ultimately the price of gasoline, getting it out of the ground, refinery and distribution, and speculators. If the world market believed that we were serious about energy independence and we were going to utilize all of our existing resources, the speculators would stop speculating up and they speculate down until we get our own oil out of the ground. Well, that was a mistake to play because now I got to do this story. Why did you warn me of this, Jr.? I just liked his rhyme at the end, man. Oh, what did he say at the end? What was the rhyme? Stop speculating up and start speculating down till we get our oil out of the ground. <laughs> we got to clip that out. Stop speculating up, start speculating down till we get our oil out of the ground. That's good stuff. Okay, so for the record, Herman Cain doesn't know what he's talking about. Very quickly, Republicans used the politically potent argument about the cost of uh, gas uh, just yesterday to pass a bill expanding offshore oil and gas exploration. But analysts, all of the analysts, say a major flaw in their, in their case, more drilling will not affect gas prices at all, which was the question from Juan Williams. The Restarting American Offshore Leasing Now Act. Herman Cain should name the act because it would sound better. The Restarting American Offshore Leasing Now Act. What the fuck kind of name is that? Why do they have to put now in there? What's wrong with the Restarting American Offshore Leasing Act? The Restarting American Offshore Leasing Now Act. Okay, all right, never mind. Anyway, it passed 266 to 144 with 33 Democrats. Um, I'm sure we know where they're from and who's there, who, in whom's, there, in whose, in whom's, whose pocket they're in. Um, so they're buying into the scheme here, it, uh, is the report here. This is a Huffington Post story. Um, so anyway, 266 to 144. Uh, Mike Lynch, of strategic he's from the Strategic Energy and Economic Research uh, Institute, or Incorporated. He says it's not going to change the price of oil overnight and probably not going to have a huge impact on the price of oil ever. And just so you know who Mike Lynch is, Mike Lynch is in favor of more drilling. Mike Lynch loves the oil and gas industry and wants to drill, but he's like, yeah, I'm in favor of drilling. It's never gonna affect the price of gas. Republicans are standing with the American people, says John Boehner, who want us to increase the supply of American energy because it will lower costs, reduce our dependence on foreign oil, and create jobs here in America. And I'm certain with $4 per gallon gas, the American people will remember who listened to them and who didn't, who lied to them. <laughs> yeah, you guys lied to them. 
Then here's uh, from uh, Glenn Thompson. He's from uh, Pennsylvania, a representative. I think gas prices, high energy costs are crushing jobs, just unnecessary. When we have access to domestic resources, gas prices go down. That's what happened in 2008, he says, when Bush opened up the uh, Outer Continental Shelf. Doc Hastings of Washington just yesterday, he sponsored the bill, said uh, he made the exact same thing. If we send a signal to the markets that we're going to go after the resources that we have in this country, I think it will have a positive impact on driving the price of gasoline down. As a matter of fact, that happened in 2008. Except it didn't. And unless you're dumb, you three guys, which is possible, likely, then you're just lying. Here's uh, Phyllis Martin. She's an analyst with the U.S. Energy Information Administration, the EIE. EIA. She says, I would really doubt that the 2008 price drop would have uh, been because we committed to more drilling. Uh, it was most likely the recession. Uh, when demand cuts back, production cuts back, and the prices fall. I know very little about economics, but that makes a tremendous amount of sense. Sense. Uh, Mike Lynch says, if the nation took an extremely vigorous stance on oil exploration, like if we went nuts and we relaxed restrictions in the Gulf and drilled in the Arctic wildlife up in Alaska, the wildlife refuge, and off the coast of California, where we have our most significant restrictions, but that's where our most easily accessible oil is. So if we went nuts and we drilled everywhere, he says it still wouldn't have any impact. And again, he supports it. He says you might, under optimistic scenarios, over five or six years, five or six years, add two million barrels a day to production. And again, he supports it. On a global scale, it's significant, but we would still be big importers. We would still be dependent on foreign oil, and it would not have any effect on prices. 2009, U.S. produced 7% of what was produced in the entire world, so increasing the oil production in the U.S. not going to make much difference in world markets. It just gets lost, says Phyllis Martin. It's not that much. Um, but more offshore drilling, in fact, would be a huge boon for who? The oil and gas companies, and that would do it. And here's, by the way, something else that Mike Lynch said, and he's even, again, a supporter of it. I know I've made that point a lot, but it's pointing out. Oh, and by the way, uh, more offshore drilling, in fact, would be a huge boon to the industry, as we said, uh, and it would mean more uh, jobs, that's true, what John Boehner said, and more tax revenue if the uh, industry's subsidies and tax breaks were revoked. <laughs> Uh, Mike Lynch again, he said he wouldn't rule out the idea of America at some point becoming energy independent someday, but he said the odds are slim. He quote, said, quote, on a scale of Osama bin Laden going to church with Pat Robertson, it's close to that. I don't know when he did this interview, <laughs> but uh, uh, that seems a little irrelevant there. Okay, so Herman Cain is uh, full of crap, but he did rally the crowd at the Republican debate. So he doesn't know what he's talking about, but he did rally the crowd, and it did work because after the debate, Frank Luntz, we're gonna tell, I'm going to tell you what Frank Lund said after the break. Should we do it or should I do it now? Does that make more sense? After? Okay, so Frank Luntz is the Republican pollster, and he met with 30 people who watched the debate and had these instant reactions to Herman Cain, and it's fascinating what happened there. And Frank Luntz said he had never seen anything like it ever in his career as a pollster. And we'll show you what those Republicans said after watching the debate and their reaction to Herman Cain when we come back on The Young Turks. Welcome back to TYT, Anna and Ben with you. It's the banana show. I love that. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to let that go. It's great. John yeah. Graziano came up with that. And every time we sign off, we're going to split. <laughs> banana split. It's good stuff. <laughs> well it? done, John Graziano. <laughs> I love it. I'm sorry. Yeah, well done, John Graziano. Well done, Anna, for completely ruining it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Why? Uh, Why did I ruin it? I said it exactly how you're supposed to say it. Right, but he's saying ruining the end. Oh, that we split in the end? Yeah. Banana split? Yeah, and now you've ruined it again. But why? <laughs> but it's a banana split, right? Yeah, but do it at the end. Uh. <laughs> not even Devastating that, point. Not even that. I'm so much just explaining it. You know, you know, you never knew. Banana split. You know, because bananas, they have this peeling, and if you open them, then they split. And then after that, then you put them on this ice cream with ice cream and nuts, then it's called a banana split. So therefore, if we do it in the show, it's, it just can't explain the whole fucking joke. It just doesn't work. <laughs> anyway, right. well done, John Graziano. Very clever. I'm in favor of it. I like it. Um, you know, we have funny listeners yeah. and not so funny listeners. <laughs> and angry, angry listeners. <laughs> we have some angry listeners yeah. as well. All right. Anyway, I have great stories for you guys, so I want to get right to it. Uh, the Huffington Post wrote this great article about um, a sex crime law in New Orleans that I didn't know about. In fact, most people don't know about it because um, 
they're extremely strict when it comes to sex laws. In fact, some of their sex laws make no sense at all. Uh, one of them is a 206-year-old law, and it's known as the crime against nature. Yeah, it's unreal. Yeah. So this particular law basically um, gives prostitutes who are caught either offering or performing oral sex or anal sex a felony charge. Okay, and this felony forces them to register as sex offenders. And in New Orleans, when you register as a sex offender, it's not just some sort of list online. It's on your driver's license. Yeah, it's, it's uh, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable what it's on. It, it's just short of stamping it on your forehead. Exactly. You walk around with this, it's like a scarlet letter, okay? And, and it just basically makes you an outcast to society. You, can, you have a difficult time finding a job. Okay, you have a difficult time finding housing because it's right there on your I identification card. Another thing that, that it does is if you are seeking rehab, okay, you want to um, sober up, there are rehab centers that deny access just yeah. because you're a, a felony sex offender. Yeah, they won't take sex offenders. They won't take sex Even offenders. Even though you're not a sex offender. You're not a pedophile. You haven't raped anyone. You've had engaged in a consensual sexual act with someone, with another adult. Exactly. Now, prostitution in New Orleans, um, if it's a first-time offense, it's considered a uh, misdemeanor. But if it's involving uh, anal sex or oral sex, then automatically it's a felony. Yeah. The, uh, uh, in addition to the driver's license, it's, uh, on, if you're on the sex offender registry, state identification cards, driver's license, and in some places, <laughs> um, your license plate. You're driving around town, sex offender. Yeah. It's really, and not like cleverly like S X O F N D R. You know, not like a clever it's little. It's clearly written out. Yeah, sex, sex offender. Oh my God. It's unbelievable. And then you have to send a postcard to all of your neighbors in, within a mile if you live in a rural t uh, community or three fourths of a mile in the city. All your neighbors, you got to send a little, hey, I'm a sex offender. My name's Lydia. I'm a sex offender. And you have to foot the bill for the postage. But you can't get a job because you're a sex offender. <laughs> no, this is unbelievable. And nobody will hire you, even like McDonald's, because they, you know why? Because you're a sex offender. Now, now let me make sure you guys get this right, okay? These women, um, they, they're women, of course, okay? None of them have uh, committed any other type of crime. Like, they're not pedophiles. They're not violent. None of that, okay? And, and our society is supposed to take prostitutes and they're supposed to help prostitutes um, somehow enter society and do jobs that are deemed acceptable or morally acceptable, right? That's the whole point of these laws. But no, that's not what they're doing in New Orleans. What they're doing is they're taking these women and they're punishing them. They're putting them on a pet, uh, putting them on a forum. They're showing them and saying, look, look at what these people are doing. They're doing anal sex. They're doing oral sex. Let's punish them. Let's look down on them. You know, let's not do what's necessary to help them. You know, because a lot of them are in bad situations. A lot of them are addicted to drugs, or a lot of them came from um, bad families. For instance, this Huffington Post article talks about um, different women that are on this sex offender registry. One of them is a woman by the name of Michelle. She's 44. Oh, she's a whore. <laughs> Sorry. Um, the first time that she, pay, that she was paid for sex was when she was 16. All right, take the fun out of it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, first sexual experience, she was 14. Mm -hmm. um, and there are others. Uh, one of them is Lori. She was, she was arrested for a crime against nature at 17 years crime old. Crime against nature. Uh, of course, who this really punishes is, mm -hmm. uh, the, to me, there's some talk of racism because the cops frequently get uh, black women for this. Mm -hmm. Because the... Eighty percent of the women on the sex offender registry that have been charged with a crime against nature are black women. Yeah, I have a tough time believing that it's targeted to black women other than the normal racism that might exist inside the New Orleans Police Department. Mm -hmm. But that this specific crime is any more racist than any other application of aggressiveness by the New Orleans Police Department. That was the only objection I had to the piece. Um, because one of the objections was is that you turn these black women and you call them prostitutes, but literally they're not getting charged with prostitution, that's a mm -hmm. misdemeanor. Um, but who it really targets, this specific law, is the transgender community. Right. Right, because I got news for you. They're not having vaginal intercourse. 
they are prevented from having really? vaginal intercourse. Yes, that's a that's shock. new information yeah, for shock, me. In a shocking development, they can't have vaginal intercourse. So I mean, it, it but it's it's ridiculous. And so the cops get in. So it's always in, you know it's the cops pretending to be Johns getting in and getting it. So you're actually if you were a woman engaged in this, mm -hmm. my advice would be to say no, no, I only have vaginal intercourse. So if you're going to get arrested, then you get arrested for that. Mm -hmm. The only way they otherwise you have to actually have the intercourse, which the cops not going to do. Right. So if there's a small lesson here, only say, nope, sorry, I don't do that. I only have vaginal intercourse. Then they'll arrest you, but you only get arrested for the misdemeanor prostitution and mm -hmm. you won't be a sex offender. Yeah, you won't be uh, put I, on but the I just, sex offender register. I just thought of that, by the way. It's a genius. We're helping people out. We're giving you guys advice. So to all the New Orleans whores who watch this show, and I know there are quite a few, <laughs> it's a terrible law. It's absurd. It is a terrible law. And, you know, I should note that, um, that there was an amendment in the state law recently, this happened just this year, that would um, allow you to get off the first time. So if you're caught breaking this uh, crime against nature law the first time, they might give you a pass, okay? But the second time, no, you're charged with a felony. And the and the crime which is the crime against nature. Yes. Crime against nature. Yeah. Why don't we talk about the real crimes against nature? Yeah. First of all, <laughs> obviously, I got news for you. Oral sex, natural. Anal sex, natural. You know how we know it because people, because uh, uh, animals, in nature, do it, and people live in nature and they do it. So it's by its very instinct, natural. So shut it and get rid of the law. And it's up to the district attorney, the parish attorneys in the. In, in the various counties to yeah. decide whether they're going to apply it. Right, exactly. So the police charge you with it because they're duty, but the, you know, but like show a little discretion. Just don't do it. Just charge them with, get around it. Charge them with prostitution. Don't, don't doom people to a lifetime of this because they're soliciting oral sex in a car. Come on. It's all about imposing someone else's morality on everyone else. It's so stupid. I got that you can't allow street walkers to give or perform oral sex in Out cars. in public. Or, got, yeah, I, that's I got, understandable, I got, of course. I got yeah. it. You can arrest people for that. Right. But come on, come on. All right. Um, there is a new civil union law in Let's, Illinois. One more quick thing about that. Yeah. It's New Orleans. Yeah. Like at strip clubs, that's happening all the time but it's never getting charged in the strip clubs because it's in the nice sort of sanctity of the strip club. So you're just applying this to sort of poor women who don't work in the strip club. All right, All right there's a civil union, um, uh, I'm sorry, a civ civil union law in Illinois. It's a new law that uh, just passed this year that would allow gay couples to adopt children, right? Great law. There are lots of foster children out there that need adoptive parents. Um, but it turns out that one of the organizations in Illinois, it's known as the Catholic Charities, uh, which has more than 3,000 children in foster care right now, uh, does not want to comply with this law. They said that they refuse to comply with it. If any gay couple comes to their organization looking to adopt a child, they're going to refer that gay couple to another uh, organization that will cater to them. To a gay-friendly adoption agency. Yes. Right. Um, and, it, and they're saying, look, 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 it, it goes against what we believe in, so we don't want to listen to the law. We'll refer these people somewhere else, right? Except the only problem is that the state of Illinois uh, currently funds that organization with $30 million each year. Yeah, so this is, a, to me, a really, really tricky case. It is. Um, because I, I'm actually a little sympathetic to Catholic charities here. Because first of all, they're doing a great thing. Mm -hmm. You know, they're putting these kids in foster homes. They're trying to get them adopted. You know, I mean, you can you can criticize the Catholic Church for a whole bunch of things, but they do a lot of great charitable work, and they do believe in some terrible things. Among them, that gay people are going to hell, mm -hmm. um, and that their their hostility toward gay rights is shameful. But I don't know that we should punish the kids for this and we could withdraw and then you got this whole church and state separation issue like maybe we shouldn't be funding them but they you know and arguably we shouldn't because that's a giant mixing of church and state but they do do the good work that other people don't do yeah. so they're probably worthy of getting the funding yeah it, it's definitely not a black and white situation right. okay because they do have thousands of children in foster care right now what they're doing is good they're not they're 
organization is denying the gay couples uh, the right to adopt, right? But at least they're referring the gay couples to organizations that would help them adopt. In the end, what I'm concerned about is not the organization itself. I'm concerned about the kids that the organization is helping, right? So if we cut state funding from these kids, uh, from this organization, the kids ultimately are the ones who are going to suffer. If like maybe that money can be redirected to someone else. Like if there's a way to redirect the money and not hurt kids in any way, but the Catholic Charities, I'm sure they use the money well. I don't think, they're not embezzling it. They're not, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. it's a tough one. If the, if the referral process is a really true, pure referral process, mm -hmm. maybe that's okay, you know. But their question, they're, they're saying, hey look, it's against our belief system. That I don't care about. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, yeah. I get it. I know why they're doing it, but like, yeah, okay, well, your belief system is screwed up, and you're getting fed, you're getting state money, mm -hmm. and we have separation of church and state, which means maybe we shouldn't give you the money in the first place. But if you're using it for secular purposes, getting the kids adopted, man, it's it's a tough one. Then the question, though, at the end, which is really the fascinating one, is like, what happens to these? Um, they, they got 1,500 kids in foster homes, right, and another 1,500 in adoption agencies, right. so 3,000 kids overall. So what happens to these kids? Because they, they're using this money to pay the foster parents. Right. Right. So what happens if they say, okay, we're not, a, we can't, we're Catholics. We literally can't give them to gay parents. We won't do it. Mm -hmm. The question is, what will they do? Will they just say, okay, we're going to not take care of the kids and let them go to other agencies? Or are they going to bite the bullet mm -hmm. and find some way around it? Like contract out another party. Mm -hmm. Like say, no, we're, we're sending them to this intermediary and they're going to adopt it out. Like, it's tricky. Like, who's going to be to blame? Who's going to blink? Right, that's true. Because I know the Catholic Charities, they don't want to abandon the kids, mm -hmm. I'm sure. But it's totally tricky of how they're, who's, how they're going to get around this. It is tricky. Yeah. yeah, and I'm curious to see what happens. But, you know, in the end, I think that they would bite the bullet. I think you're right about that. I don't think they will. I think that, or they'll have to find a way around. But they're not just going to say, okay, we're going to adopt a gay. We're not going to send those kids to gay couples. They can't do it. They're Catholics. That's they, so, they but you know, it. the whole purpose of your organization is to help kids, you know? And sometimes you have to let go of your own biases in the name of these kids. If these kids are right now in foster homes and they want to be in a stable home where someone is going to take care of them and be true parents to them, why are you going to deny that to them because of your own biases? Yeah, I mean, you're making a totally rational argument. You know what yeah. they'll be, is they'll be, like there frequently is, they'll be some radical priest. Mm -hmm. Some priest will be like, hey man, I, I got it. I don't think that gay people should get married either, but I'm... I'm going to allow them to adopt. Or he'll be like, yeah, look, I'm Catholic and I still, I'm, I'm going to, I don't care. I, I, I don't agree with, with the stance, but they don't think that they're denying them a good home. They think they're denying them an unstable radical home that's going to ruin the kid that's what they actually think and it's stupid mm -hmm. but they're not thinking oh because i hate those gay people i'm going to keep this kid out of this sure. good home they're thinking oh i got to keep this good kid out of that evil home and they're right. dumb for that well they you could know? definitely do it if they didn't take the money then they could do whatever they want yeah you know theoretically so the problem is the money from the state it's a tough one it's a fun case yeah all right. Uh, the Texas legislator, uh, legislature just passed uh, a bill yesterday that would require doctors to show women who are seeking abortion uh, the ultrasound. Not only will these women have to look at the ultrasound, the doctor will also have to describe the fetus to the woman. So uh, he would have to describe the arms and the legs, whether or not there are any existing organs. I like to describe the arms and the legs. Their arms and legs. <laughs> You describe the arms and legs. The arms come out of the side, and they have like uh, I don't know little things at the end with the uh, I don't know. Uh, it's called hands, and they're similar things on the legs, but they're not. They they seem less uh, dexterous. Uh, and, but they will support the kid if he ever has to stand up. I mean, what, what do you describe the arms and legs? <laughs> so stupid. Yeah, and of course this is all done to make the woman feel guilty and yeah. make her rethink having the abortion. It's just to delay, everything they want to do is delay the process. They want to delay it, they don't want to delay it. They want to make women not have it. But there's one thing in here that is so stupid. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, they got the incest, rape, fetal abnormality exception, right? Then, right. You're, then you don't have to hear a description of it. <laughs> like, like, in that case, maybe you want to hear a description of the abnormality. Like, that might be relevant, right? Okay, but I presume you already know, right? Um, so, <laughs> the existence of arms, legs, and internal organs. Yeah, it's got two arms, two legs, and a lung. Two of them. <laughs> what kind of fucking... 
stupid losses. But the best part is, an exception to the waiting period was made for women who live more than 100 miles from the nearest abortion provider. Like, like there's no fundamental logical basis for the law if you're including that. Mm -hmm. Like, I get why they are, because they know the argument that's going to come next, which is, you can't have women who live 100 miles away and go to all this trouble and have to stay in a hotel or whatever, that they got to have this other long process added. But unless you just admit that what you're trying to do is prevent women from having an abortion, if theoretically you, you're going to make this stupid argument that, no, no, we want women to fully understand, well, then rural women have to dr go 100 miles. They need to understand also. Mm -hmm. like, it doesn't make any sense. It's just, it's just, it, it, it's revelatory of what it is. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I agree with you. And like I said, it's all about shaming the woman, right. making her feel really bad, making her think like, oh, I'm carrying this full-term baby. I'm carrying this baby that if I give birth to right now would be able to live on its own. It's got arms and legs and internal organs. It's got arms and legs and a liver. Um, <laughs> so therefore, it's got eyebrows. So, um, the, uh, so basically, like the, my example of uh, telling uh, uh, New Orleans hookers to ask for vaginal sex, as your only, it's all you get is vaginal sex. That'll keep you from a felony charge. Uh, here, uh, get a rural P.O. box and say, yeah. and say I, took, I went 162 miles. Please don't tell me about my kid's arms. <laughs> don't tell me about my fetus's arms. It's so stupid. What is, who are these people? What is wrong with people? Let's do one more story before we take a break. Right. So there's this century-old cemetery in El Dorado Hills, California. And it actually holds the bodies of people that were buried uh, from an area known as Negro Hill. Okay, so by the, the way, come on, already funny. Yeah. And, <laughs> it, by the way, I did some research on that town, and I was like, okay, was it always named Negro Hill? Did they ever change the name? No, it's Negro Hills, California. Is that right? Yeah, <laughs> awesome. it still exists. <laughs> um, what they did was uh, the bodies were originally buried there, and they were bodies of gold miners. Okay, some of them black, some of them white. And uh, the state of California decided they wanted to build a reservoir in uh, Negro Hills. So what they did is they moved the bodies to another area. They moved it to El Dorado Hills, California. Okay. Now, when they moved the bodies, uh, they created gravestones. And the gravestone said... Uh, gravestones at the original site. At the old site. Right. At, at the new site, I'm sorry. At the new site, oh, okay. they created um, new gravestones. Oh, okay. And I see. the government did this, okay? The, oh, I see. Right. At the new one, and they said moved from the old one. Yeah. Right. Okay. And the gravestone said, unknown, moved here, uh, moved from... You got to say it. Nigger Hill Cemetery by U.S. government, 1954. <laughs> it's just so... It's horrible. But, but it wasn't moved from... Nigger that, Hill. Right. It, it was moved from Negro Hill. Why did they randomly decide to use well, it's that a, word? I'm sure it's, in this case, I'm going to cut, like, the government a break because it's whatever dick did the engraving, you know? Right. Right. It's whatever, like, guys were like, uh, you know, because it's 1954. It's like Brown versus Board of Education. You know, that was like when the use of the N-word was at its height, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and, uh, and it was met with the most hostility that it had ever been. Like, it meant hate right? more than ever. It always did, but it meant it in particularly virulent fashion what's, in the 50s and 60s. By the way, the person who created these gravestones was a complete idiot yes. because most of the bodies weren't even I know, black. <laughs> like, they weren't even black people. They're, it, whatever. But, okay, so now there are activists that are trying to get these gravestones removed uh, and replaced with gravestones that actually make sense. Yeah. Do you, you know, at the, in the first hour, I don't know whether you heard the story. We did, it's a terrible story of that 10-year-old who killed his neo-Nazi father. Yes. Um, and we ran some, some clips of him and his idiot buddy from 2009 when they were at some anti-immigrant were wearing our Nazi uniforms. Mm -hmm. Like, here's a newsflash. Uh, racists are idiots. Like, in yeah. this case, like, okay, they're not even black guys buried there. Yeah. Like, doesn't matter. None of it excuses this clownish behavior. But, and then this the neo-Nazi guy, when he was, he was like, yeah, the, check it out, the immigration law passed in the 1960s, written by two Jews. Yeah, ex except it wasn't. Like, it doesn't matter whether it was or wasn't, except it wasn't. Like, they're just, they, just, they just say stuff. They just make things up. They just make things up because they're too dumb to read anything. Whatever.
Good. By the way, the history of Negro Hill is very interesting. It turns out that two black men, uh, one was a Methodist preacher, struck gold in uh, 1849, and the area was called Negro Hill. <laughs> That's kind of amazing. Uh, full service community, 1,200 people, schools, shops. Hey, where do you live? Ah, I live over in Negro Hill. Oh yeah, I just li I live right outside of Negro Hill. <laughs> amazing. Yeah. You learn something new every day. It's right next to. Uh, uh, I've been there. It's right next to uh, Blackville. <laughs> All right, we got to take a break. Let's take a break, and when we come back, we have some fun stories, including a 23-year-old who created a smart business last Sunday. Wait, hold on. Uh -huh. <laughs> to make way for the, I didn't read the story. When I read it this morning, I didn't get all the way to page two. To make way for the reservoir, the agency hired a contractor to relocate 13 cemeteries, right, and burial sites in 1954. That's what you were saying. In 1961, it transferred rights of Negro Hill over to Mormon Island Relocation Cemetery. <laughs> Who's with these people? <laughs> Negro Hill, Mormon, Mormon Island. Island. Yeah, I, I, I got a name for you. El Dorado Hills, uh, uh, here, Denver. Those are names. Yeah. Phoenix. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I agree with you. Yeah. Mormon Island, Negro Hill. Come on, man. Let's take a break.